Roland Bart picked up on this in the 1960s and applied it to the same way that Jean-Francois does to more cultural manifestations. Uh, for example, the fashion system was one of Bart's favorites, where, for example, the axis of selection could be a type of hat you might wear. So you could have a pillbox, leopard skin pillbox hat, a la Bob Dylan, or you could have a cowboy hat, or you could have a Homburg. They're all types of hat, but they're not the same type of hat. In other words, you could select a different one, right? Similarly, you could select different tops. You could have a blouse, a shirt, a, a jumper, or whatever. Different kinds of pants, short, long, whatever, flared, drain pipe. And then, and I'm, I'm trying to do justice to the fashion part of this. <laughs> and then shoes, they could be high heel stilettos, they could be flats, they could be winkle pickers, they could be chiseled, and so on and so forth. But they're all types of shoe. So although they're part of the axis of selection, the whole ensemble of the outfit is like the horizontal axis. You've got what you wear on your head, what you wear on the top, what you wear at the bottom, and then what you wear at your feet. It's the same structural system. So we could start to see Jean-Francois's work then as um, similar then to Bart's idea of how langu language can work structurally. We've got the idea of how certain images can resonate across and between each other depending on what they conjure up in your head, uh, maybe like a painting that they remind you of, a Rembrandt, um, a Vermeer. And then you start to think of all the paintings that you've seen, and then it suddenly becomes an art history lesson. So the fashion system segues into an art history uh, system. Bart also came up with a, another analogy, which is that of the restaurant menu. So you've got, for example, the selection axis, which is, what do you eat as an hors d'oeuvre? What do you eat as the entree? What do you eat as the dessert? And what wine do you have with it? And what kind of after-dinner beverage do you finish it off with? Right? So you could have you know, your meat entree, your fish entree, or a salad as an entree, as, as a process of selection. But the equivalent of the, of the fashion ensemble, then, would be the whole meal. Maybe you might skip a course, so that might be a variation on it. But again, you can see how it all fits a relational structural system that you can apply to practically anything. And if you think about it, almost every movie you see is structured in exactly the same way also. And if, if it, it's no accident that Jean-Francois's work, when you look at it horizontally, resembles a storyboard, not only in the way it's styled and designed, but in how it evokes editing and montage. I was talking earlier uh, about the Kuleshov experiment, which was developed by a Russian director in the 1920s, called Kuleshov, who was trying to demonstrate how, in effect, actors are worthless. <laughs> uh, because he was dealing with a, something of a prima donna actor who wanted, you know, very Stanislavski style, who wanted to get in touch with his deep emotions in order to convey what he was trying to convey. And in the Kuleshov experiment was designed to say, it doesn't matter what you're thinking inside, it's how I edit it that counts. <laughs> so he said, just stand there and stare into space. And he said, okay, are you done yet? And he said, no, just keep staring into space. Okay. What am I supposed to be thinking about? Doesn't matter, just stare into space. So then he takes him staring into space for about three seconds, cuts in a five second shot of a sandwich, and then cuts back to the actor staring into space. And the actor could be thinking about anything, but in the process of editing it together, he's now hungry, <laughs> right? And it's the system and the structure of the system that gives it that meaning Nothing intrinsic to the image itself. So again, when we apply that to Jean-Francois's Jean work, he may have been thinking about something specific in generating a particular image, but it's only in how it is presented as part of the relational system that it creates meaning for the spectator. And of course, we bring all of our collective baggage to bear on it as well, to transform it even further. 
So right from the get-go, it struck me that Jean-Francois's work was a, a, a major paradigm, if you like, if you want to apply the vertical axis again, to how structural linguistics works, but also works as an artwork where it's not pinned down to something as banal as the cat sat on the mat. It's more of a, of a profound cinematic kind of language and editing closer to the Kuleshov experiment where you feel this man's hunger even though he's not acting hungry. It's the process that's making him hungry, in other words. Um, it's not that far of a leap to extend this linguistic structure to a more psychological ramification where we can bring in Freud, in particular, uh, also Jacques Lacan, who is an application of Freud to structural linguistics through his statement that the unconscious is structured like a language because the unconscious is formed by language for Lacan. We're not born with an unconscious. In fact, the, the unconscious develops in and through our entering into language, what he calls the symbolic, and it takes on the characteristics of Jacobson's two axes. But instead of the paradigm and metaphor axis, the vertical axis, for Freud and Lacan, it's an axis of condensation. And the horizontal axis, instead of being that of meta metonym or syntagm in language, is that of displacement in psychoanalytic terms. And it's the intersection of those two axes that constitute the structure of what Freud calls the dream work. In other words, dreams are a manifestation of this lang language structure. And the dream work works through condensation and displacement. And this is appropriate to Jean-Francois's method because Jean-Francois predominantly works in this series through images rather than words. Yes, there are some words in there. Um, but in, in a way, he translates the words as much into images as anything else. And part of the difficulty of interpreting dreams for Freud is to try and decipher how and why it's working as an image and not just simply as language. And what does that image mean? Well, part of the, the way that you analyze the dream work is to find out what the core of the dream is, its latent content, by seeing how it's been distorted through condensation and displacement through these language methods. So that, for example, if the dream is about fear of your father, in terms of condensation, the father may be um, condensed into one singular form in the dream. But at the same time, that father may be disguised by being dispersed and displaced throughout the dream into stand-ins for the father figure, like teachers, common one, uh, any authority figures. You may have a dream about being pulled over by the cops for speeding, but it could really be about your Oedipal relationship to your father. <laughs> um, I mean, no, this is a banal interpretation. Um, or you could be having a dream about a football game where you've got 11 fathers on the field at once and they're all kind of tripping over each other trying to take the dominant role. <laughs> and uh, so that's an another case of displacement. And um, you could argue then that Jean-Francois' work, if you wanted to analyze it through a Freudian framework, then is using these images in a similar way. So by turning the handle you're creating different forms of condensation and creating new strings of images, you're creating new forms of displacement. It's no accident also that Jean-Francois sees these works as types of machine. And Freud and uh, his contemporary Henri Bergson also saw the structure of the mind as an apparatus, a machinic apparatus a sensory motor apparatus, in fact. Uh, in more simple terms, it's an input-output machine. The whole body is an input-output machine made up of images. 
Perceptions, then, for someone like Henri Bergson, are an infinite aggregate of images, but through which each body, for, through a process of selection, through perception, chooses the images they need for their immediate needs. So for example, if, I'm, if I were to pick up this bottle of water, you're all sitting there, I'm shaking it, I'm looking for a target, I'm going to fling it across the room at somebody. Out of all of the aggregate of images that will be racing through your mind in the split second that it's flying across the room, it's very unlikely that you're going to be going, I'm thirsty, I'd like to get a bit of that. <laughs> in other words, the self-protection image will rise up from your memory bank, banks and your automatic motor res response will be to duck, right? Same when you're crossing the street. You don't just stand there and admire the bodywork of that Mustang coming at you at 40 miles an hour. You get out of the way, right? So in that respect then, images as part of this bigger machine are always a paring down process from an infinite aggr aggregate of possibilities to the one that suit your needs in the, at the given moment. And Jean-Francois's um, work again is playing around with that concept that as the manipulator of these images through selection and creating new strings of possibilities, you are, with his help, because he's pre-selected many of these images for you, you're creating new possible aggregates out of your immediate needs as the spectator and user of the work. So you see one image, it then triggers the possibility of finding another one that could go with it, and then all of a sudden you're generating a narrative as you go along in accordance with your needs. You might go, oh, that reminds me of a room I grew up with in a, in a, as a child. Oh, this one looks like my grandmother's room. And so you put the two together. And all of a sudden, you've got a memory trace in accordance with a kind of desire based on childhood memories, which is exactly how the Bergson Freudian machine works. So already, just using language, we're we've had an intersection then, an interdisciplinary intersection of structural linguistics, um, psychoanalytic theory, and also Bergson's conception of, of the image, which is of course also apropos to an understanding of the cinema. Every film director and every editor has the opportunity of selecting from a potential infinity of images too, but they select the ones they want to select to tell the story they need to tell. They also have the opportunity to leave out images if they need to, simply because your ability, and Jean-Francois again plays on this, to be able to make connections, to jump across gaps, is so well developed, you don't need all the information. Classic example would be if you're watching a film and someone puts on their hat and coat, goes out the door, then you cut to them emerging in the street, and then you cut to them in the back of a taxi. The director doesn't need to show them getting into the elevator, going down the elevator, going through the lobby, waiting for the cab, hailing the cab. And I mean, certain kinds of directors like to show that because they uh, like to undo the conventions of cinema. But more often than not, they leave that stuff out because you're able to fill in the gaps yourself because you're driven by a need for motor continuity. So even faced with Jean-Francois's deliberate fragmentation of the work and the image, you are searching for connections almost as a matter of course, because A, you desire them, and B, it gives meaning to your application of the memory image to, in many ways, your own personal history. Um, I put up a couple of examples of a, of a row of images to show how this works uh, in a specific instance in the work. And um, 